All right, here we are, Story Strategy Live. Welcome to episode 19. This is Exploring Deep Point of View with USA Today bestselling author, Sierra Simone. Welcome, Sierra Simone. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, Don and Nancy are here too, as always. Um, so I have notes there, like my whole setup is different than normal. So I'm gonna be like wildly glancing around trying to figure out what's going on. I got a new computer, which is a good thing, but also not always a good thing because nothing works quite like it did before. Right. Um, anyway, here we are. So Sierra Simone is the author of how many? Lots, lots of books. Lots, I lost count. <laughs> yeah, so 20 something probably. Yeah. Um, she is an Evident Ink client, which is awesome. And uh, we have known each other hmm, at least five years, probably more. I think that it's probably around seven, maybe. Yeah. So we were part of a, a mom's writing group. Yeah. Back in the early, early days of indie publishing. Yes. I think it was, I think it's seven or eight because we went on a really wonderful writing retreat. Um, do you remember that? It was at Estes Park. Um, and that was 20 remember. So we, we had known each other for a little while by then too. So yeah. yeah, it's been quite some time. It has. And it's been fun because during that time, your, your career kind of went, went crazy because was it Priest that was sort of the breakout book? Yeah, I think it was Priest. And so as a little bit of background, I started out writing traditionally published young adult fiction under a different name. And that's what I was writing when Nancy and I met. Um, and then I switched over to writing um, erotic romance because why not? It was a lot more fun <laughs> than young adult at the time. Well, and when, when Priest went crazy, I had no idea that you were Sierra Simone. Yes. Well, and that was on purpose for the most part because um, I was still publishing young adult books. And so I didn't want to combine, I didn't want to have too much bleed over from the two different names until I was out of contract with Penguin because I didn't want them to be like, ah, who is, here's our author, Bethany Hagen, and what's this book, Priest, that she, <laughs> that she wrote? I didn't think that would go over well. So um, I kind of kept the two separate for a little while. And so Sierra was kind of, um, she kind of started out as a side project. And then after I released Priest, I really, um, felt so much more engaged with romance and like writing the romance and just like the romance voice that I continued on writing romance and kind of set young adult to the side. Well, in your romance, which I, I, I think erotic literotica or something like that is already a word that other people have used, but you are a very literary writer. Um, your style is, is very literary in my view. Um, and so I always find it very interesting because you have you bring in a lot of theology and mythology and sort of very educated topics. Um, and so you're you're a super interesting writer. But the reason that I wanted you to come talk to us today, and I don't know how much Dawn has gotten to read of your work, but she is an expert at deep point of view. And I said when we were talking about her deep point of view class, like, hey, you know who does this really well? Because I honestly didn't know what it was. I was like, I don't really get what deep POV is until she was explaining it. I'm like, oh, that's what Sierra Simone does. Like, awesome. So that is why you are here today. Okay, so well, I, well, and I have to say, Nancy's overselling me a little bit here. I appreciate that. But <laughs> you know what, though? No, I decided I was talking to her the other day. Women of a certain age who are established in their careers should own what they're good at. And I had yeah. someone say to me, I am very good at this. And I was like, wow, that was really impressive the way she just said that. And I'm like, I'm going to start doing that. So Don, you're, that. Very, you're both very good at deep POV. Well, thank well, you. I don't think I had actually heard this term either until you said it to me, Nancy. And then I started okay. like, um, <laughs> thinking around. As a writer, I was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Don, do you want to talk a little bit about like what your conception of deep POV is and like how it's used by authors in fiction? Sure. My thing about deep POV is that it is slipping into your character's head and you see everything through their filter because everybody brings your background and your own biases and your own experiences and all of that to everything that we look at. And so that really feeds into your character's voice because you see everything the way they would, even if it's completely different from how the author would. 
Right, right. Which is kind of an extension, like an evolution of the Jane Austen, like free and direct discourse, right? Which is sort of in third or omniscient POV, kind of slipping seamlessly from an expansive omniscient narration into um, a very, very close third, mm -hmm. which is, um, I think the book I remember it the most in is Persuasion. And there's this part where the main character, the heroine, she's in a room with children and um, a child like leaps up and like grabs onto her neck and is hanging off of her back. And it goes from describing sort of the sitting room and who's in it to the sensation of sort of being choked by this child who's just trying to give her a hug. And she says, um, you know, she became aware of the weight lifting of the arms gently untangling, but she didn't know who it was. And so in that moment, normally in a Jane Austen book, you are very aware of who is where, like sort of geographically in the drawing room or the ballroom or whatever. And in that moment, you're only aware of what, is it Anne, that's the main character? You're only aware of what Anne is aware of, which is just the sensation of being freed of this child. She doesn't know who's lifted the child off her. She doesn't know who else is in the room. Um, and so you're really only aware of what she is in that moment. And so when she turns and sees Captain Wentworth, it's a total surprise. And then it's also a total surprise for the reader. Like the reader has that mm -hmm. immediacy in the moment of being like, aha, like handsome hero man. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea he was gonna be in here. And so it really lends this immediacy to it. Um, and she was one of the first authors to really utilize that depth. Um, to that point, most fiction had been told sort of at a distance, right? With this sort mm -hmm. of like godlike narration. And she really flattened the distance, right? Between the authorial imagination and what the reader was experiencing. Um, she, she shrunk that distance to be uh, new and almost invisible. Well, so that's something that's easier to do than it sounds like in first person. And it's almost surprising to hear an example where it's been used in third person because I'm sitting here almost going like, well, how, how would you do that? So you just move the perspective that much closer to the character. Yeah. And I think it's like within sentences, she does it, you know, it's like one sentence is sort of the camera panned out and then it just sort of zooms in. Mm -hmm. So you have one paragraph that's totally omniscient as we know it, and then another paragraph that's a super close third as a modern reader would know it now. Um, and she was the first to sort of toggle, she toggles back and forth between it through the whole book mm -hmm. um, without using like a scene break or a chapter break or anything like that. It's all within the same block of text. So it's really interesting because she's really getting to use the best of both tools, you know, like here's her, her table of tools and she's able to kind of freely appropriate whichever she feels like is the most needed in that moment. Yeah. Do you think that most authors that really are able to drill down into their characters, thoughts and feelings that way are using first? What do you normally write in? I almost always write in first um, because I am, you know, DPOV is a really kind way. I think sometimes to say maybe like a little navel gazy <laughs> and all of my characters are a little navel gazy. Um, but for me, because the way I write is um, I have a very specific order of how I write things. And I don't think I have, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to show a diagram here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I love diagrams. <laughs> So the way I approach writing is sort of this like upside down triangle. And the first thing, the first part of the triangle for me is setting. And so once I figure out where the, where the story is set, um, then I can really start establishing how I want this book to feel. And usually when I start out writing a story, that feeling is sort of the kernel of where a story comes from. So I want to make readers feel the same way I feel when I hear minute three, second 15 of a certain song. I want readers to feel the way I feel when I think about King Arthur. So how can I make this, how can I turn this feeling into an entire world? And I think Thorn Chapel is a good example of that, where it's like the world has an atmosphere to it that sort of creates this feeling. Yeah. Um, and then once I've kind of gotten that setting down, then I move down to character. And so then once I know a setting, I can start asking myself like, 
who are the people that you expect to find here? Who are the people who would be surprising here? So with priest, it's like, if I'm set in a church, you know, with old stained glass windows and old fashioned confessional, of course I expect to find a priest there, but who I don't expect is a stripper. So like, you know, who are these people that can populate the world that would be both expected and surprising? Um, and what's the friction between their presence and the environment they're in? Um, and so once I have the characters and their relationship to the setting, the last part of the triangle, the plot part, like, uh, kind of unfolds on its own. Um, and so really my plots are pretty like bare boned sort of like bullet points. Like I know these few things are probably gonna happen, um, but I only know them because that's an extension of who the characters are and how they're reacting to their setting. Um, and so when I'm writing, when I'm writing who the character is and what their sort of frictions are, is my main preoccupation, not getting from beat one to beat two on a beat, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I feel like that naturally unfolds into writing with a deeper POV because it has to be by necessity, their reactions, the consequences to their reactions, their choices, their contradictions that inform what happens next. And a reader's not gonna know understand what happens next without intimately knowing their internal landscape. Um, because it's that landscape that is sort of exerting itself onto the story. Um, and so I think it's a pretty, if you write something that's more character driven in general versus um, like premise driven or plot driven, I think it's very easy to start slipping into that deep POV because it's necessary to pull the reader along with you through the story. Well, and I think you made a perfect point there of it's their reaction and their interaction with the setting. And it's, that's why it's very important that it's specific to that character. Yes. And um, I can tell you because I do the developmental editing. So I work with some of our newbie authors who aren't familiar with this. It's not that easy. You make it look really easy and you do it amazing but it's not that easy for some of them because they feel like, well, the um, the reader needs to know everything. She just walked into her house after a long day at work. The reader needs to know that if she turns left, she goes to the bathroom. If she goes straight down the hall, there's a kitchen. And then there's sliding glass doors that go out to a patio with a tree that her grandfather planted 30 years ago. So how do you kind of cut through all of that and get to what the character needs to move that story along? Well, so two things. Um, the first thing I would say is, hold on, let me write down my thoughts. I think I have like, I'm so forgetful these days. Um, okay. If anyone ever looked at my notes, they would be like, what the hell? Because I just wrote eye patch down. Um, so <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the first thing I would say is that I do think the process of writing character driven work is recursive in that it's very rare for me to sit down and without starting a draft to just create a character document, you know, just to like write in everything I need to know about this character, where they went to college and how they feel about things. I could probably fill in the basics so like, okay, they grew up here. This is their family dynamic, that kind of thing, but their internal landscape, like whether or not they're optimistic, whether or not they're contradictory, whether or not they know that they're contradictory, like those things I really do have to start exploring in the draft. Like I really do just have to jump in feet first um, and let myself, I think not every writer is like this, but I really need to engage with the actual words, like on a, like the language to um, understand what I'm writing. So if I can't see the words on the page, if I can't hear the rhythm of it in my head, then it's really hard for me to get a sense of who that character is. So it's recursive in that I do have to start writing them to know who they are, but I have to know who they are in order to start writing. Um, and so it does create kind of this, um, vortex at the beginning of each project where the first 10 or 20,000 words are very slow and painstaking because I'm sort of excavating this character as I write. And then as I do, as I learn more about the character, I have to go back to the beginning and really make sure that I'm 
threading in who this character is and letting that inform the whole work so that it doesn't feel like a different character from chapter one to chapter five when I finally know who they are. Um, the other thing I will say, and this was really helpful to me as a newbie writer, um, one of my creative writing teachers in college always used to say, um, what's the eye patch of the character? And then that, that applies to everything. What's what's the eye patch of the house? What's the eye patch of the scene? And what he meant by that was, what's the sort of like one or two characteristics, distinguishing details about this person or setting that the reader needs to have in their mind right now? And so if someone is wearing an eye patch, that's gonna be one of the like major details that you have in your head. Because no one, a reader or an author, can have a complete, photographic image of a person or a setting in their head while they're also reading through a chapter. It's just like too much to hold in your head. So what you really want to do is focus on like, what are the details I want this reader to have with them and carry with them through this moment? Is it the blue eyes? Is it the torn clothing? Is it the bloody hand? You know, and if it's a setting, so it's like you're talking about you have a character come home from work and I just need to give them the whole floor plan of the house and that kind of thing. You know, it's asking yourself, what's the eye patch of this moment? If this character's walking in, what's the one thing I want, I want to stand out? Well, it's, she always keeps the wine, not in the fridge, but under the sink because she doesn't want her sister to know, you know, like, so that kind of detail still anchors you into the moment, into the setting, but it feeds back into how you want the character in the moment to feel to the reader. Um, there's, I'm sure you guys know this rule and I'm probably gonna paraphrase it badly. There's this rule about dialogue, right? That it's supposed to accomplish four things. It's like text, subtext, uh, characterization, and moving the plot forward. Well, when I think of eye patch details, I like to have that sort of thing in my head too. So like something like keeping the wine under the sink, doesn't just anchor us geographically, but it also accomplishes some characterization. And it also says like, what else is she gonna do later? If she has a whole bottle of wine, she gets online, she starts looking up her ex, like that's <laughs> that's <laughs> things <laughs> happen. <laughs> so it could potentially move the plot forward too. So being really uh, thoughtful with those details, I think ends up making a more, um, it just makes a deeper impression with a reader versus giving them everything at once. Um, like brains are really bad at sifting through information. This is one of the things that I'm like trying to accept, you know, sort of being a virtual learning para for my kids. <laughs> is that I really do just need like prioritized information because if I have a whole block of information, like a 37 page document about reopening schools, it's gonna be really hard for me to assess like what's the thing to focus on. Yeah. Um, and so like doing a favor for your readers and prioritizing for them what they need to know at that moment um, can hopefully bridge the gap between what you're picturing in your head and what you want your reader to feel. And I do think that we all as authors hear these rules like that we're supposed to abide by all the time. And one of them is like, well, the reader has to know everything the character knows. Otherwise, like, you know, it's dramatic irony and it's breaking rules or something. And it's like, no, like the reader doesn't need to know everything the character knows. Because well, and you don't think about everything you know all the time. Right. <laughs> like when I walk into my house, I don't think about the fact that I have a tree in the backyard. Right. Yeah. I know it's there but it's not important to this moment. Right. Well, and the other thing I was gonna say has completely left my head, um, but I know I read it down earlier. So, oh, I know. Um, so if you're giving this deep view sort of inside the character's head, um, either, you know, their perceptions of their world or, or what they're thinking about what they're seeing, you know, whatever it is that you're sort of offering us this introverted sort of in, introspection on how do how do you still pull off like an unreliable narrator or does it does it make the characters too self-aware to have them you know doing all this navel gazing D does it make it too everything has to go on the page then how does a, an author that hasn't used this tool a lot decide like how do they still make characters interesting do you know what i mean Yes, right. Because then there's like no, there's very little mystery, right? Yeah, if I can see everything inside you, then eh, you're not that interesting, right? So I think 
this is something I am still like actively grappling with. So I don't have an answer to this so much as I have like what I've been thinking about now, because in my current series, I do have an unreliable narrator. And so one of the things I've found is that I've been giving him a lot less page time because like I have to make sure that everything I put on the page can retroactively fit what happens later. But again, if I have them on the page all the time, there's no way that that wouldn't emerge at some point. Um, and I think also being really selective with scenes. So like everyone sort of makes fun of Twilight, even though I really liked the way that Stephanie Meyer did this. But the thing about Twilight is you're with Bella in almost every moment of her day. So you see Bella eat cereal out of her plastic bowl and you see her work on her book report and you see her go for a walk and you see her have dinner with Charlie. You see her in every moment. I think with deep POV, like being selective about which moments you're going to show can be really important because otherwise, I mean, I'm already wordy and I'm already working on this, but otherwise you're going to have, you know, a really sprawling story. And that's one way to sort of tighten it up is instead of showing you from sunup to sundown what the character is doing, I'm going to show you what they're doing just for lunch or just when they walk in the house and they find the broken vase on the floor, you know, like just those moments. Right. So in a way it's sort of like the eye patch method writ large with, the mm -hmm. the plot and the chapters you know like what's the real eye patch of act one you know what's the eye patch of act two that kind mm -hmm. of thing so you could still write a character without having them be too self-aware maybe they aren't even they can still talk about what they perceive the world to be like but maybe their perception is is not accurate absolutely i mean i think that like the important thing about romance in particular is that almost all characters are operating under some sense of self delusion otherwise the moment they met they would be able to communicate clearly and honestly about what they wanted from each other and then the happily ever after would happen on page <laughs> 5 <laughs> we just and skip so, right through everything exactly so i I personally, obviously, if anyone has read any of my books, don't have a problem with this, but I really believe in letting your characters make mistakes and do the wrong things. And if you're going to have a character who makes mistakes, they have to usually believe that they're doing the right thing for some reason, whether it's instinctive self-protection, whether it's anger, but it feels justified at the moment like they people are not generally villains in their own heads and so making them think that they're right for making things that even the reader knows are mistakes like that is writing self-delusion to some extent and i think the more you the more instability you're willing to give a character not necessarily in terms of mental health but in terms of like story disruption like you're not letting their lives be static or comfortable the more discomfort you're willing to subject a person to the more those self delusions will sort of expand right because that's how we react under stress and so like really giving your characters a lot of stress and conflict will help you create those sort of mistake bearing situations and that that then allows for growth towards the end of the book where they can realize their self delusions and change their behaviors well and we lie to ourselves all the time because again i'm looking at it through my filter and so when i go in and you know get that bowl of ice cream in the kitchen i'm like this is fine it's fine it's eight o'clock in the morning but you know it's fine right and, and so i've I'm looking at that if I'm a character and I'm looking at that through my filter of I've had a rough day at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm going to eat this rocky road right now. That's okay. Then you don't, and it, because again, you don't think about everything, you know, at every moment. Right. So the character is still interesting because if you opened a book with somebody eating rocky road at eight o'clock in the morning, the, the reader is going to be like, Oh, so there's something off here. But, you know, and so you're still creating those character questions. So yeah. I actually think I like that you use the word questions because that's one of the things that I always try to embed in my story as much as possible is questions. And then I think what is hard for authors to resist is the feeling that you need to answer questions immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and part of this is because there are always going to be some readers who want questions answered immediately. Like 
he walked in the house and he picked up the picture frame and his throat closed up with tears, but he refused to shed them and he put the picture frame back down. There's always gonna be readers who are like, well, who was in the picture frame? <laughs> But as a as an author, it's your job to know, I'm going to wait till the next scene. And then mm -hmm. all I'm going to tell you in the next scene is it's a little boy with blonde hair. And then in the next chapter, you might learn a little bit more. And so embedding questions, not just plot wise, but in characters is really important. And then answering them, staggering out those answers over time. Um, and then also giving false answers, you know, like I think that we are really great as people at giving ourselves fal false answers all the time. I know I do this where I'm like, I read an Instagram post today and I'm fixed, you know, like uh, it said I should just love myself, baby. And that's what I'm going to say. And I'm all fixed. <laughs> and then like that's like its own new delusion, its own fresh problem. Well, I think giving, leaving those questions unanswered is what makes people turn the page yes. and having characters who either believe something that isn't true about themselves or refuse to answer their own questions for the reader is what makes you invest in those characters. Yes. And without, I, I mean, what's, it's not a very interesting book if, you know, the character knows everything about themselves and are, is fully self-realized and like, what's the point? Right. Like I, I think that there's um I think there's both like the like the fiction the allure of fiction, right? Is sort of this how is the tension going to be resolved? The tension of this person who is super messed up or super self-deluded or whatever right now. Um I know that they're going to get a happily ever after, but how? So there's the allure of that tension. But I think on like a deeper subconscious level, there is a real catharsis to watching someone overcome demons, even if they're mm -hmm. small, even if they're small rom com -y kind of demons, like being a workaholic or something like that. Like there's a real catharsis to it. And I think like we are growing sort of increasingly secular as a society. And I think more and more we look to fiction to give us answers about how to be good people, like how to be human, like every fiction book we read is sort of like a text in how to be human. And so reading texts of people forced to relate to other people, even when they're antagonists, like in an enemies to lover stories or forced to acknowledge a transformation in their feelings. Like we see in a friends to lover story, like all of these are just examples and narratives of how to negotiate being human around other humans. Um, and so I think that like the more you sort of lean into that, like the juicier your story is going to be to readers. Yeah, I love that you say that. We, we've been talking a lot kind of about what, where we're trying to focus um, these story strategy discussions. And more and more, we've come to decide that story is what fuels humanity, basically. It drives every industry. It drives every action that we take as human beings. So exploring what makes great stories and what makes stories interesting is just like, that's my jam. It's yeah. so good. <laughs> and I, um, I don't know how many people watching are members of RWA, but if you're a member of RWA, I highly recommend purchasing. It's only $5. The audio of Dr. Jennifer Lynn Barnes, um, at the wow. 2018 RWA, she gave a presentation on the psychology of fiction. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Lynn Barnes, is a uh, she's a professor of psychology and her focus is on fiction and her sub focus is on uh, the psychology of fandom. So she really studies like what what makes people obsessed, you know, with certain stories or worlds. Um, but her talk at RWA was really amazing. And she covers a lot of like, here are possibly some of the evolutionary origins of fiction, like why we're drawn to narratives. And that's one of them is like, this is what it means to be human. Um, mm -hmm. So I highly recommend it. It's only $5 and it's like, I, I promise I don't get like a commission or anything. I just like <laughs> just full of Dr. Jennifer Lynn Barnes, wherever I go. <laughs> I well, think, I've listened to that talk and it's very good. It's so very, very good. That one. I know I was there, but I, I, I heard her speak though at um, Romance Author Mastermind last year, and she talked about fandom. Yeah, and, you know what makes fans rabid, and it was just super, super interesting. 
It is. She did, She has another talk from that same RWA called Writing Your Id, which I oh, also yeah. highly, yeah, I also highly recommend that one too. Um, and that's really all about writing the things that light you up. So not writing to market, not, um, you know, writing because you feel like, oh, my readers asked for, you know, more rom-coms, but really I like writing, I don't know, motorcycle club dragon shifters. So what should I, <laughs> what should I write? You know, and the answer is like, you should write what gives you pleasure. Um, even if it doesn't feel like that's going to give you the widest audience base, you don't want the widest audience base. You want the most dedicated audience base. Yeah. And so writing your id is a gateway to that. Well, and I think that comes back to kind of our topic too, of when you are getting into these characters and you are trying to slip into their mind, it's always easier to do if it's something that you're excited about and you know the character and you love the character and you want the character to experience, usually we want them to experience some really bad stuff before we let them experience the good stuff, but you want them to go through this and then you tell it in a way that the readers want to go through it with them. Yes. And I think when you are not quite in that space, readers who uh, follow authors and follow certain series and that kind of stuff, they can pick out it, pick it out when it's inauthentic very quickly. Oh, yes. I 100% agree. And um, I really think that so certain authors I find have certain clusters of not just ids, but like themes that they're really coming back to. And, you know, you can point to certain authors and you can say, okay, so their themes are really about family and loyalty or their themes are really about like shame and guilt and God, like me. <laughs> um, and so I do think that like, it's almost always, it's not inevitable, but I think it's more honest if the character is undergoing a catharsis that you either intimately understand or are going through yourself or hope to undergo through yourself. So a lot of the transformations that my characters go through are things that I deeply understand and have only just translated into a different situation or kind of abstracted from what it meant to me. Um, and sometimes there are more um, they're more abstracted than others. I don't know if you guys have, um, so, so old, but Amanda Palmer, the lead singer of the Dresden Dolls, um, she had this metaphor. So her ex-husband, husband at the time, Neil Gaiman had just written a book and she was describing that like sometimes artists, they put all of their experiences, their transformations, all of that, their history into like a blender. And there's different like blending settings. So you can puree something to where, you know, the origin of that particular teaspoon of the smoothie, you're not gonna be able to tell if it's banana or apple because it's all so seamlessly blended together. And then you can blend things together a little bit more like chunky, like a salsa where you can pick up something and be like, well, that's a tomato, that's an onion, <laughs> you know? And this idea that, different artists sort of tend to different blend settings. So some people, you'll never be able to extract exactly what influence or moment uh, leaked its way into a book. And there's other authors where sort of wholesale moments are lifted out. Um, and I like to toggle a lot between the two. Like with Sinner, at the end of Sinner, spoiler alert, <laughs> the main character's mom dies. And that's something that was really wholesale lifted from my experience. Like that blend setting was really low. And, um, but I think I've had a lot of people respond to that part because they've also lost a parent. And so like that, res there's a really honest resonance in it because I didn't abstract it a whole lot. I didn't filter it a whole lot. I was just like, this is what it's like to lose a parent. It's raw and it's weird and it's complicated. Um, and so I think there's a real honesty when you're writing from something you understand, which isn't to say, like that a theme has to be experienced super directly. Like I think that someone could still write about themes of loss without having someone close to them die. Um, but I think that the, the root of the feeling has to be authentic. Like you have to really empathize and understand loss in order to write it into a character, uh, especially with a deep POV where you're gonna be really in their inner landscape. Yeah. I saw, a um, presenter one time talking about the whole write what you know thing and how, you know, you're not necessarily limited to writing what you know. And he brought up, uh, and I wish I could remember who this was because so whoever you are, I give you credit, but he brought up that um, 
you know, like if you're writing a thriller, there's a really good chance you've never killed anybody. Right. <laughs> you know, he's like, and he's like, and hopefully, you know, sitting in this room, but that you, it's okay that you haven't killed somebody because maybe you've run over a turtle. <laughs> right. You, you can relate the same like gut feeling you get in the same, you know, those, or, and that was um, related to causing the death of somebody who said, but he's like, or, you know, maybe you've had to hunt down that spider in your bedroom because you weren't going to sleep until that thing was dead. And so that's another way that you could, that it's a really distant feeling from what the actual feeling would be for the character. But you can kind of, like you were talking about, I love the blender thing. You could blend that in enough that people wouldn't know that I translated tracking down the spider to, you know, tracking down my husband's killer, that kind of thing. <laughs> yes, because I think that like, emotional honesty is the key not like a literal honesty mm -hmm. um and so having that emotional honesty sorry the phone rang <laughs> is really is really important um again because if you're in someone's internal landscape like everything is zoomed in um and so you have to it's like having a high resolution photo like it has to be able to withstand being zoomed in um because everyone can tell when it's going to be pixelated you know and inauthentic Right. But I think those experiences, whether they're your own or one that you've witnessed, pers you know, up close because a friend or a family member or somebody has gone through them, the part of the reason that I write is because it's, I think it's the way that I process those emotions that come up as I witness life. Right. And I don't know how else to, I guess, give myself the space to understand what's happening or what has happened or how I felt about what I saw or experienced. Um, so I think, I think that's part of what makes people write. And if you're doing that, then hopefully that's what draws other people to read what you've written because it does feel authentic. Yes. And I think that like, there's a right time for every story. So like even readers who don't normally want like a painful catharsis, like they might reach a time in their life when they're able to go back to those books and really experience them anew. And so that's one thing that I try to remind myself of when, you know, if I'm writing a book and I have readers say like, oh, like this just, it just isn't working for me. One of the things I try to remember is like, well, of course it couldn't be, it might not be working because it's not a good book, but it also might not be working because right now it's on a certain wavelength that a reader can't fully plug into. And when you're in first person and you're in a really intimate POV, if you can't plug in to it, then you're just not going to connect with any part of the story. Um, and so that's one thing I try to remember is like some, sometimes these books that are really intimately told might not work for everyone at the same time. You know, they might have to come back to them. It might never work for them for whatever reason. And that's okay too. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a story for every reader. There's a reader for every story. And yeah. You find your well, people. and I think something you just said right there is very important because we, um, one of the things we talked about in the notes was, is there a time where deep POV is too much? Is there a time where you should pull back? And yeah. I have an opinion on that, but what is your opinion on that first? <laughs> I think yes. And I also think that learning when is like, it's like an apprenticeship level skill, you know, like it's hard to sit down with someone and say, okay, I think, you know, not knowing anything else, not having read the scene, I think that this one should be deeper. I think this one should pull back a little bit, you know, I think it's really hard to do uh, to learn without doing, I guess, like you really have to be in there writing and then look at the product and then be like, no, I could refine it by either, you know, pulling in or pulling out. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think like there are some authors like Kara McKenna and um, Charlotte Stein who always write like very, very zoomed in um, and very rarely pull out, but they're very good about creating worlds and characters that that's not necessary. But if I was reading something like, um, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good example, like a Christina Lauren book, and they didn't ever pull out to show me the secondary characters or the setting, like I would feel really like I was missing something because the secondary characters and the setting are usually a pretty vibrant part of the story that they're telling. And so like, they're usually pretty good about giving you 
that flexibility, toggling between these closer moments and these further back moments, um, because they're creating worlds and secondary characters that are so vibrant that they need to be in there. And you wouldn't get them in the same way if it was constantly like this mm -hmm. with the character. So do you think, is that a genre difference? Like I know I write, you know, small town rom-com. So there is a cast of characters that readers expect to see. And if I were to just focus on the hero and heroine, you'd miss out on all the antics and the stuff going on in the background that I think rom-com is expected to deliver. Yes, but I would say that I think it's almost more, um, trope specific than genre specific if that makes sense so like a small town like people are signing up for a certain thing with a small town like they're signing up for the town you know for the community and for that sense of found family um and then because i was gonna say i was going to agree with you and be like well yeah like obviously erotic romance lends itself really intimately to deep pov because you want to know when people are getting the tinglies you know down in their underpants like i want to know when they're having feelings feelings but i actually was thinking like no i've read erotic romances like that are taboo that are like captive romances or motorcycle club erotic romances where the suspense element or what's happening that has injected this character into the situation can't be ignored either um so i really think it kind of depends on what trope you're going for um that kind of informs that. So like with a priest falling in love, right? Like you kind of need to be super plugged in to feel what's going on. And the conflict is mostly internal. Like the there is external conflict in the sense that his vocation is like exerting this pressure on him, but that ties in directly to the internal conflict. But if I'm writing something about like, six 20 somethings are in a crumbling old manor house where there used to be human sacrifice, <laughs> then like right. that is also really important to their conflict as well. And so like, I don't know, I think it is actually a little bit story to story, which is probably not the answer that people want to hear because it's not that's easy. Always the answer, right? Don? Always the answer. Yes. That's <laughs> absolutely always the answer. Well, and to, to kind of play off of both of what both of you said, like with uh, Nancy, with your small town romances, you are still presenting that cast of characters through the filter of your POV character. True. It's, and you don't ever pull all the way back and say up on the hill, there's an inn and the woman who owns the inn has taxidermied cats everywhere that you show your character walking into that place and seeing all of the wonderful taxidermy and a couple of wombats. And that's all going through your character's filter. You know me so well. I do. I do. And, so, and then to go with what, with what you were saying, Sierra, is that whenever, um, the, especially like with the erotic romance and you were talking about how, you know, everybody wants to know what the feelings are and yes, they do. It, this is not a instruction manual. Okay. Yeah. Tell me, <laughs> I don't want step by step, but the opposite side of that, because I have edited for a few um, dark, romance writers is sometimes in those darker romance, there's moments where you want that space there for the reader, especially yeah. if you are talking about um, some level of abuse or some level of trauma in yeah. the path. And then that's, that's where you can move back and move forward. Well, and and so I, it's, go ahead. Yeah, like I think point of view is, um, is a tool like the lens itself is a tool and what we romanticize and what we fetishize and like in what um in how we want to frame something right so like i had um an audiobook narrator tell me that um she was reading a book uh for audible and there was like a an abuse of a minor in the very beginning and it was supposed to be a romance book and the abuse was couched in terms that were just as romantic and like uh reader engaging as the later on like consensual sex scenes and so she ended up pulling out of reading the book because she was like this is this is a problem like i don't mm -hmm. you know i don't think that this is okay and it was because the reader had romanticized that that uh, non-consensual encounter. Um, and so I think that like the lens we use can be really deliberately deployed. Um, and if it's sort of, it can cause unintentional problems if we don't deploy it right, right? So it's like, we can make things intimate that maybe should not be intimate or 
we maybe we should use that intimacy to really um, uh, infect the reader with a sense of horror or sadness. So how we use that lens is really important. And one of the things I was gonna say that you mentioned like about how Nancy's characters are always seeing each other through their own personal lens is that when you're writing sequential standalones, right? So standalones that are set in the same world, I think it's like a real gift to yourself as an author to lean into that. So like with Priest, I have this Priest character and then he has two brothers who are like, millionaire businessmen who he calls the the business brothers. And they're just like on the page in Priest, they're just sort of like stereotypical, like jerk wad, white guy, business guys, you know, they're like handsome and they like money and they like strippers. So then when I got to Sinner, as you do, <laughs> as you do when I got to Sinner, I have to make one of the business brothers a hero, right? And so then I started asking myself, like, what would be surprising about this character? So Father Bell only saw these things about his brother, but now I'm inside this brother and I can start mining him for interesting things. Like what's the most surprising thing? Okay, he loves to read romance with his mom and he has a romance book club with his mom. So then as an author, I've got like, I've got this like loves strippers and money, loves reading romance with his mom. And then I've given myself this whole space, this whole landscape to explore in that sort of intimate POV. Like what is the common root between the two? How can the same person exhibit both, both of these behaviors? And so then I have all this room in the middle to sort of like explore. And so I think like if you're writing sequential standalone set in the same world, it's a real gift to yourself to make secondary characters as filtered through the protagonist POV as possible. So if the old lady who does taxidermy, if one character thinks like, well, she is just a wacky old hermit, <laughs> but then <laughs> another character knows that every Friday night, she like gets in her souped up Corvette and goes drag racing, like with 17 year old high school students, then we have like this really interesting friction, right? Like these really hidden depths that we're able to explore depending on who's looking at her. Right. Well, and that makes the writing fun, right? Yeah. If you're writing right. characters that you already completely understand, there's no point writing the book. Right. Yes. I 100% always feel this way, which is why, like, it can take me a little while to write because I really have to get to that point of discovery with a character. Like, what well, about the character surprises me? That's the enjoyment. And in a way, writing a book is a very selfish act. Because oh, yeah. you just spend all this time alone with your little people that you've created, learning about them, having fun, like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if they did this? Like, and if, until the book is published, you're the only person who is involved in any of this. Right. But, so if you don't set it up so that you have something to learn or explore as you're doing it, then I can't even imagine writing the book. Why? It would be, it would be so awful. I 100% yeah, all of those super plotter people that have like their 12 worksheets yeah. filled out. And um, I know one of those personally, they are gasping in horror and clutching their pearls right now. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I like to make people clutch their pearls now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's good for them. Uh, it is. Well, we, we have actually gone on about 45 minutes, a little longer. So we should probably start to taper it off. Um, it has been really, really fun talking to you, Sierra. Thank you so yeah. much for coming on today. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I hope I hope I I didn't like under undo all your deep POV work, Don. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you you abs every time you're like the we've got to focus on what the reader needs to know in that moment. I'm like, yes, do you know how many times a day I type that in a comment? <laughs> do they need to know this right now? Exactly. No, 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 they never do. But well, and I think a good like a good metric for an author is like, if you're feeling um, disinterested or stalled out in a particular moment, then probably the reader will too. And I would say when that happens to me, 50% of the time it's because I'm writing in the wrong direction. And then the other 50% of the time it's because I'm trying to sketch the whole iceberg instead of just the part of the iceberg that's gonna hit the ship. You know, like when the iceberg hits the Titanic, we're concerned with the part that hits the ship. We're not concerned with like, <laughs> The ice sheet it came from a hundred years before that, the direction it traveled around Newfoundland. Like we don't need to know all that. We just need to know like, here's the iceberg and it hits the ship. So right. usually like it's a pretty good barometer if you're feeling as an author, like 
stuck or something like that, like you either have too much of the iceberg or you're you're in the you're in the wrong iceberg altogether. You're in the Bahamas. <laughs> you know, <I> <laughs> Not a lot of icebergs. <laughs> Um, will you put in the comments when we're done, when you think of it, the, um, if there is a link, I don't know if there is to the, um, the RWA talk you were talking about, or at least to, um, Dr. Barnard, is that her name? Dr. Jennifer Lynn Barnes. And Barnes. she also writes young adult fiction, but sort of like, um, criminal minds, but teenagers. Well, I think she's got a couple nonfiction books, doesn't she? Or she was talking about having she's at least about, she's working on one now that's about like is in the psychology of fiction, but I don't know if it's published yet. So I think right now those talks are the best shot at getting getting to her theories and getting to listen to her. Okay. Well, if we could link them kind of as references or, or some way to find them, that would be awesome. Can do. And how to find you and what you have coming up and all that. Can do. And what do you have coming up? You're in, you're still working on Thorn Chapel, right? I'm fin Yes, I am going to finish up the Thorn Chapel series this year if it kills me. Um, <laughs> and it might. And, uh, and I am also releasing a um, novella next month um, in an anthology called Naughty Brits. And um, I think Nancy got to look at some of those. And oh, yes. I didn't know that's what I was doing, but yes. <laughs> Um, and so they are, um, the novellas all take place in England and they all involve someone having sex at the British Museum. And mine is oh, nice. <laughs> about a professor and a student and there is indeed museum sex in there. So uh, that is coming out September 15th and I'm really excited about it. Very cool. Yeah. All right. And what do we have coming up, Don? Do we have exciting things? We do have exciting things. We always have exciting things. Um, next week, we have uh, Terry Shepard, who is the author of the book Chasing Vega, which is an awesome thriller if you're into thrillers. And he makes these great book trailers. And so we're going to talk to him about how do you extract the part of the story that's going to be the most intriguing to create the book trailer, which is related to... How do you put that in a blurb? How do you put that in a query? How do you draw in that interest? So interest. that's what we have next week. And cool. then I can finally say, because it's confirmed, that in September we have Eva Charles. Yay. And she is going to be talking about um, she's going to be talking about writing dark romance and dark heroes and all of that. Dark things. Dark <laughs> things. Dark, dark things. awesome things. There you go. All right. Awesome. Good. Well, we are, we're lining up some other interesting folks and we'll continue kind of exploring what story means in fiction writing and, and outside of that as well. So thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you again next week. Bye.